Well, hi there. I'm here today um, because we actually want to return to a topic that we discussed a little bit in the past. We've already made a video about spider ball pythons in which we talked about really the cool science involved with spider and what's going on there with them genetically and in terms of uh, what, what sorts of phenotypic attributes are associated with it and a lot of the pros and cons to owning a spider, why you might not want one yourself. And you can check that video out right here. I strongly recommend it actually. And it turned out that, you know, it was probably the most controversial topic that we have discussed since the proper pronunciation of the word Argentine. I actually, I wasn't even sure I wanted to come back here, but I, I was uh, really encouraged by the results of a recent poll that we did on our channel that you know over 5,000 of you responded to, and I really appreciate that feedback. It really helps us a lot as we try to make important decisions like this one for our channel. We did a video before about the spider ball python, in which I revealed the fact that I have bred spiders in the past and that I'm not particularly bothered by the breeding of spider ball pythons. But, I did not make any attempt at all to explain why I'm okay with this. And, you know, in fact, I, I was quite clear about the fact that I, I wasn't going to try to persuade you one way or the other. Uh, I wanted what I wanted to share with you, and the reason that we even made a video about spider ball pythons is just because I wanted to talk to you about the cool science uh, related to spider ball python. And I wanted to give you kind of the pros and cons of spiders so that you could make an informed decision as to whether or not you should get one yourself. Sort of like we do for all the animals that we cover on Clinch Reptiles. In our poll, we discovered that at least 74% of you disagree with my position on the breeding of spider ball pythons and only 18% express that they agree with my position. And and this honestly didn't surprise me at all, given what I've seen on social media over the last few months. What I really, really appreciated though, was that of the people that said that they disagree with my position, 95% said that they would like to hear why I feel the way that I do about the breeding of spider ball pythons. I think that that is super cool. Stinking rad, if you will. We live in a world right now, honestly, where people are so quick to demonize people that disagree with them, and they make virtually no effort to understand where people with opposing views are coming from. I really, really appreciate that you guys are open-minded enough to hear me out about this. That is so cool. In my opinion, it's always okay to disagree so long as you understand both sides of the argument. I think, you know, in the case of breeding spider ball pythons, for example, I think we all have our hearts in the right place. And sometimes when we are open-minded enough to actually have a conversation and hear each other out, we discover that we don't really disagree at all. And honestly, you know, if it weren't for this poll, I wouldn't be making this video at all. So I just want to say thank you. I really appreciate you. Uh, I think that this is something that is a little bit unusual in the world today, and I'm, I'm grateful to see it here. So to begin, I am a scientist. One thing that I've learned as a scientist is that the evidence doesn't always support what is intuitively true or what feels right. I am easily persuaded by evidence and not easily persuaded by emotional appeals. In fact, if the only argument that you can make is an emotional appeal, I think there's a pretty good chance you're not on the side of truth. There are many poor arguments that can be made uh, against breeding spider ball pythons. I'm not going to address those, they're just bad arguments. But there is also a very good argument to be made against breeding spider ball pythons. First is that all spider ball pythons everywhere have some degree of a neurological defect that alters their behavior. Second, in some cases, that neurological defect can become debilitatingly severe. And third, choosing color or behavior over the health of the animal is morally wrong. And I think that this is a completely valid case because most of these things are true. And so now I'd like to tell you a story. When I was a little kid, my favorite story in the world was the three little pigs. I, I mean, I'm not talking a, like a, a little kid, I'm talking like a toddler. I would stand up in my crib and I'd yell, pigs, for my parents to play the audio tape because I'm old. The audio tape of the Three Little Pigs story, it was my favorite and I wanted to hear it all the time. 
As a result, I became paralyzingly afraid of the big bad wolf. This is Theo. He's my dog and he is a little bad wolf. In fact, he's just a, he's a terrible wolf. He's defective in oh so many ways and he wouldn't last a day in the wild. He'd just wanna play with things that he should eat and also with things that would probably eat him. If you notice, like most domestic dogs, he's got floppy ears and he's got a neurological disorder that is associated with those floppy ears. This neurological disorder, which causes him to be super laid back and happy-go-lucky, uh, is either linked or pleiotropically related to the floppy ears. You can't have one without the other. In fact, when they tried to breed domestic foxes for calmer behavior, they ended up getting floppy ears just like our domestic wolves. Spider ball pythons also have a mutation that causes both a phenotypic, well, a coloration alteration and a behavioral defect, just like my dog. And this gets us to a really important question, which is what is a defect? A defect is an imperfection or something that alters the intended function. And this leads us to another really important question, which is, what does a perfect ball python look like? And what is the intended function of a ball python? This is a very teleological argument in that it assumes that there is a perfect intended form of a ball python. This is a wild type of a peppered moth, which is a pretty beautiful little moth, right? And this is a mutant peppered moth. Now the question is, which one is perfect and which one's defective? After the start of the Industrial Revolution, trees near major cities were stained black. After this happened, we gotta ask ourselves the question again, which one is the perfect moth and which one's defective? While I'm not convinced that nature makes perfect organisms, which one is defective is hugely context dependent. This is a wild type ball python. Wild type for both ball pythons and really in any species that you would find is the suite of alleles that have been the most successful in the wild environment. So that is the context in which the wild type ball python has been historically the most successful coloration and temperament. This snake would stand out like a sore thumb in Africa, and he would likely die long before he would ever get a chance to pass on his genes. Poor Sinatra. Fortunately for Sinatra, the selective pressures in my house are completely different than they would be in the wild of Africa. Just like my dog Theo, the attributes that are the most successful in captivity might be completely different than those that are the most successful in the wild. Theo is a terrible wolf but he's a great pet. Wild type wolves are great wolves, but they're terrible pets. So what's best depends on the environment in which they're found. So now our big question is, how do spider ball pythons do in the captive environment? Get my spider back for this. When it comes to survival and reproduction, which is really the way that you measure success of well, not organisms generally, in captivity, spider ball pythons do, they do great. That's how we went from having just a few imported spider ball pythons to thousands and thousands of spider ball pythons in captivity. It's because they do really well in captivity. But there is a really important question, and that is, are they suffering? You know, just because they, they survive and reproduce, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not suffering, and, and if they are suffering, that could be a complete deal breaker. So how do we determine if they are suffering or not? One way would be to put yourself in their shoes. The problem is that you would hate to have almost no legs live in a hole and eat rats. They can't even wear shoes. So uh, this isn't a good way to determine uh, if they're suffering or not. You would be suffering if you were a ball python, but that doesn't mean that they are. The next way would be to look for typical signs of stress for a snake. Stressed snakes tend to exhibit a few behaviors that are very indicative of a stressed snake. One thing is they tend to be very restless. They also tend to refrain from activities like feeding and breeding, and they will often regurgitate meals because they are stressed. And then, you know, the worst thing that can happen is that they will die prematurely as a result of consistent stress. Are there some stressed spider ball pythons out there? Yes, 
Absolutely there are, for sure. Are there some stressed non-spider ball pythons out there? Yes, there are also stressed non-spider ball pythons. Are spider ball pythons more likely to be stressed than are non-spider ball pythons? This is an important question. And as far as I can tell from all the data I've observed, they're not. They're not any more likely to be stressed than our other ball pythons. My spider ball pythons are not any more restless than are my other snakes. I, I actually, I just took in a few uh, as a rehoming and so I actually have a number of spiders, including, uh, you know, the clutch that I produced last year, and I've got a few adults and then those that I took in, and none of them are exhibiting uh, restlessness any more so than are any other ball pythons in my collection. Spider ball pythons are good breeders, and they're notoriously good feeders. At least, you know, from the reports that I've seen, many people seem to perceive them as being better feeders than our other ball pythons, and I don't think we have enough like official data to conclude one way or another, but there definitely seems to be no sign that they feed worse than do other ball pythons. Potentially they feed much, much better. I've never heard of spider ball pythons having issues with regurgitation. I've never had a, a spider ball python regurgitate. I know of no evidence that spider ball pythons die prematurely, uh, though uh, homozygotes will. So you don't want to breed spider to spider because they won't get out of the egg. But when it comes to the heterozygous spiders, which is every spider you've ever seen, uh, I, I, I've seen no evidence that they die prematurely. And this is actually an interesting thing because I've heard a lot of people say that, well, you know, the problem with spider is that they're inbred. And uh, spiders are actually generally not inbred. This, this is one snake that you do not want to be breeding to other spiders. And so they tend to be outcrossed more so than are many other morphs, especially the recessive morphs. So the inbreeding isn't the problem with spiders. Wobble is either pleiotropy or it is linkage. But don't breed spiders to spiders would definitely be my recommendation if you want them all to hatch. I wouldn't want to be a spider ball python, but I wouldn't want to be a ball python at all. There's no evidence that I've seen that spider ball pythons are stressed or are suffering in any way. Frankly, most of them seem to do better in captivity than do other ball pythons, at least if it turns out to be true that they really are better feeders than our other ball pythons. And I have seen this from a lot of sources with big sample sizes. I just don't know if we have enough data to conclude that for sure. But there certainly are some examples of spider ball pythons that exhibit a truly debilitating wobble. And, and a really important question is why? And the answer is we don't know. Every example of a spider ball python with a really bad wobble that I've seen, including the one that I've seen personally, they were all rescue snakes taken in from unknown circumstances. Lots of rescue snakes, including snakes that have none of the genetic markers that would indicate that they should have wobble, exhibit symptoms sort of like wobble. It seems possible that spider is a minimally different condition generally speaking, that can be exacerbated by poor care. But new evidence could absolutely change my mind about that. People talk about them changing from not having a severe wobble to having a severe wobble, but as I mentioned in our last video, I've actually seen no evidence of that other than just people saying that it can happen. Are spiders the same as other ball pythons? No, they're not. They're not. Would I recommend them to somebody who was aware of the wobble and ready for their first snake? Yeah, I totally would, I totally would. Spider ball pythons do better in captivity than almost any species of snake we try to keep. The only reason to get a snake like, say, a Brazilian rainbow boa is because you like the behavior and the coloration of a Brazilian rainbow boa better than you like the behavior and coloration of something like a ball python. But Brazilian rainbow boas, as it turns out, are much less likely to thrive and survive in captivity than are ball pythons, including spider ball pythons. Should an informed and prepared keeper be allowed to keep a Brazilian rainbow boa? Yeah, I think so, absolutely, why not? Should breeders of spider ball pythons do more to inform their customers about wobble? I think so, absolutely. And hopefully videos like the last one that we've made and like this one are helping to raise awareness about wobble so that people go into it informed and ready because when people go into it informed and ready, they tend to have just phenomenal success with spider ball pythons. And, you know, and to conclude, I've seen a lot of people compare spider ball pythons to human conditions such as autism. And, you know, often it's done in really poor taste. And 
to be perfectly frank, Wobble isn't autism. But in some ways, it's not a bad comparison. People with autism, and I have a lot of friends that have autism, they're wired a little bit differently than our people without autism. But every person I know with autism has like a mental superpower. It, it, without fail, everybody I know with autism can do things, uh, they can remember things, they can see patterns, and they just have mental abilities that most people without autism do not have. And I think in most cases, they wouldn't trade that ability to be a little more normal. Is it better or worse to have autism? I think it's just different. It's just different, and that's okay. Are spider ball pythons also different? You bet. They're different not only in terms of color, but also in terms of behavior. But would I give a spider ball python to somebody who, you know, was ready for their first snake and I wanted them to get a snake that they would be able to keep alive? Yeah, absolutely. They could totally have success, great success with the spider ball python. The truth is that in the captive environment, spider ball pythons are one of the most likely snakes to thrive. Could new evidence change my mind? Absolutely, but it would take evidence. I don't like demonizing people. I don't like restrictions and bans that are based on anecdotal evidence and emotional pleas, especially when those things go against the greater weight of evidence that exists. I think that we should inform people, absolutely, about all sorts of reptiles that they might get. And while I don't think that it's there's a problem with breeding spider ball pythons, I definitely don't think that they're for everyone. I feel the same way about green iguanas, giant snakes, and Nile monitors, right? They're not for everyone. In fact, those animals, I would say, are not for most people. But I think you should be free to get one, especially if you know what you're getting yourself into. If you're informed, can you have great success with a spider ball python? Heck, they might actually do better than any other ball pythons, but I'd welcome evidence to the contrary, if it exists. Thank you so much for giving me the chance to talk to you guys about spider ball pythons today. Like I said, you know, I, I, have, I have complete respect for people who don't want to buy spider ball pythons, who wouldn't breed them themselves. Right? That's totally reasonable. I choose not to own and not to breed most species of reptiles because they're not right for me. But as far as the snakes are concerned, if we're going to keep snakes, and if we're concerned about snakes surviving and thriving in all measurable ways in captivity, a spider ball python is one of the best pet snakes you could possibly get. And, and so I think that they should continue to be available. And I definitely don't think that we should look down on people that, that produce them for the hobby. If you don't want one, and if nobody wants one, no one will breed them. But I think they're really special snakes. I think they, they, they do great. I love the ones that I have. As always, like and subscribe, and we hope to see you real soon. Quit. Okay. Get excited already. I am excited. Why aren't you excited? Because this is a little bit intense, this one. But it's good. I've, I have put a lot of thought into this particular script. Uh, that's not your style, though. You're more of a fly by the seat of your pants. Fly by the seat of your pants. Yeah. You're, you don't think things through at all. Good. That's, I mean... You know, the scores and stuff, you just make them up on the fly. The scores, yeah, I'm like, it seems like a, let's give them a three. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Clint, do you hate animals? No, I love animals. Do you hate reptiles? Love reptiles. Do you hate snakes? Uh, I love them arguably the most. Do you breed spiders on a ridiculously large scale? I have produced one clutch of spiders. A single clutch? A single clutch. Interesting. Uh, do you make buku dollars on the uh, spiders that you breed? I have definitely spent more money on spider ball pythons by a long way than I have received from selling spider ball pythons. So with you not making a ton of money. No, terrible money. Terrible money. <laughs> spider ball pythons are, are a money sink for me. Uh, do you feel like you're you're biased in your opinion with, uh, because it's gonna be a big money maker for you? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not biased by money with them, not at all. Because I haven't even made, I've never made an effort to sell a spider ball python.